The other thing too that we noticed as well was companies didn't really want to take it on any new things because they were just focused on their core business. And also like everyone's working remotely and working from home. So more challenging to communicate with people. Hello and welcome to the Solar Maverick podcast, where solar meets entrepreneurship and experience. I'm your host, Benoit Thanjan. So let's get into it. Hi, this is Benoit, your host of the Solar Maverick podcast. This episode is about solar trends and 2020 year in review. I usually interview a guest or have another co-host, but it'll be me for this episode. Thank you for listening to the podcast. If you have feedback or comments, please reach out to us at info at renewenergy.com. That's I-N-F-O at R-E-N-E-U energy.com. We'll also have that in the notes of the podcast. And if this podcast is adding value to you, please provide a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and press the subscribe button. Also, let people that you think might be interested learn about the podcast as well. Let them know about it. I'm the CEO and founder of Renew Energy. We develop solar projects in the Northeast Mid-Atlantic. We also assist other developers with sourcing financing for their projects. And we also manage and sell SRECs for asset owners. So an SREC, if you're not familiar, it is a solar renewable energy credit that is an incentive created by the state to incentivize development of solar. And I have about 13 years of experience in the renewable energy industry. And it's amazing just to see how quickly the industry is growing and changing. One of the biggest trends that is happening in the solar industry, that solar is going to eventually be the cheapest form of electricity. The big question is when. Wood McKenzie, which is a research firm, said that the cost of solar power has dropped 90% over the last two decades and will likely fall another 15 to 25% in the decade to come. By 2030, solar will become the cheapest source of new power in every U.S. state, including Canada, China, and 14 other nations. And that's pretty amazing now that we're in 2021, that in nine years that could potentially happen. And we'll see. I mean, I have a feeling that costs will potentially drop more than 15 to 20 percent. And what we've seen is because of costs going down exponentially, that the number of insulations and the number of gigawatts of solar have been increasing dramatically. So according to Bloomberg New Energy Finance, BNEF, solar made great strides in the past decade, rising from 43 gigawatts of total capacity installed in 2010 to 651 gigawatts as of year end 2019. And 2019 had about 118 gigawatts installed. And then 2020, even with the coronavirus disruption, produced yet another record for solar installations. And these solar installations are worldwide information. It's not just the U.S. and it was 132 gigawatts last year globally. And what they're forecasting for uh, 2021 is to have the first 150 gigawatt year. They say that there could be between 150 to 191 gigawatts of new solar additions in this year, 2021. The U.S. solar market had 19 gigawatts in the U.S. in 2020, which was basically around 6% less than the pre-COVID forecast. But I think considering the situation, that was pretty amazing. And as we know, like COVID-19 has impacted all businesses in 2020, and we're continuing to deal with it as well in 2021, and solar is no different. But one thing that I would say, even that the solar industry has been extremely resilient during this time, and we saw delays in construction in certain states due to lockdown orders, solar was not considered essential construction. Also, financing for solar projects were impacted. Tax equity, which is a big part of the financing of solar projects, was majorly impacted based on COVID. And if you're not familiar with tax equity, basically a lot of these large investors of solar projects need a third party tax equity investor to take the tax attributes that are produced from a solar project. These tax equity investors or partners are used usually like banks, companies, and high net worth individuals or family offices. The big incentive for solar is the federal investment tax credit, which is currently for 2021 at 26% tax credit for solar systems. The other tax incentive is accelerated depreciation of solar projects through makers. And what ended up happening was once the pandemic started, some tax equity investors basically left the market. And that was due to them not being sure with the pandemic 
pandemic, what their taxable income was going to be and potentially their taxable income could be lower. And we actually experienced this on one of the projects that we were working on where we were about to close with an investor and the tax equity investor partner for them pulled out and then they had to find a new tax equity partner, which they found like later in the year. But we found another investor for the project. It was interesting actually to hear from Steve Rader and Brian from Summit Ridge Energy on episode 87 of the podcast. They talk about the challenges that they had. They lost their tax equity partner in the beginning of the pandemic, and they were able to find a new tax equity partner. I think it was two partners, you know, during the pandemic. And what I saw as well is that some of the tax equity partners that were on the sideline came back in the third and fourth quarter of 2020. And we'll see as well how like the tax equity market is impacted because there are some companies that will make less income and they would have used the taxable income for tax equity. So, you know, in 2021, we'll have a better idea too if there's any longer term impacts of the pandemic, it hurting the financials of companies, which I have seen actually from a real estate company that is a tax equity investor that, you know, they're pretty much going to be on the sidelines for the next two years. So it's definitely something that, you know, we're still kind of moderating. But I think the good thing is that a lot of the tax equity did come back into the market. You know, it's obviously challenging when the growth of the industry is dependent on, you know, something like investment tax credit and having a taxable income appetite. And it creates more complexities related to structuring versus, let's say, if you had it as a cash grant, which it used to be in 2010 as part of the Arrera grant. And it was basically a 30 percent tax grant that you got from the government for the cost of your solar system. And I know different lobbying groups are lobbying to bring that back and to bring either the tax credit back to 30 percent, which it was before. And so, you know, obviously financing was an issue, as I mentioned. Also, interconnection and permitting were being delivered delayed due to offices being closed and people working from home. We also saw where processes were done online instead of in person, which saved time and money. And, you know, I'm hoping after the pandemic that that continues. There was the supply disruption as well in the supply chain, but not as bad as a lot of people expected. Paul Wormser from Clean Energy Associates, I interviewed him on episode 92 of the podcast, and Andy Klump, who's the CEO and founder of Clean Energy Associates in episode 80, and they talk about how the disruption wasn't as bad as they expected. I also interviewed Suvi Sharma from Solaria. They're a residential solar manufacturer, and they have actually a facility in Korea, and he said that they weren't really offline. Maybe it was a half a week or a week due to COVID, which is pretty impressive if you think about that. One thing, though, that was interesting was that there was a demand disruption. So in the beginning of the pandemic, it was a lot harder to meet with the customer due to COVID. According to SIA, which is a solar energy industry association, and Wood McKenzie, like solar installations in the U.S. dropped nearly 20 percent in the second quarter of 2020 from the first ever as the pandemic prompted stay-at-home orders. What was interesting was that after this initial sort of demand disruption, at least in the residential sector, there was a big rebound later in 2020. This is something that Suvi Sharma from Solaria mentioned, as well as Nate Giovanelli from IGS Solar. So definitely, you know, companies were working with different methods of building that customer relationship, obviously like Zoom and other platforms were very helpful. You know, I still think based on our experience, you know, talking to commercial industrial building owners and land donors that it's more challenging if you can't meet them in person. It's a lot harder to build a relationship primarily based on Zoom. Like there's still a difference with meeting in person. The other thing too that we noticed as well was companies didn't really want to take it on any new things because they were just focused on their core business. And also like everyone's working remotely and working from home. So more challenging to communicate with people. But what we found was that the power purchase agreement became more popular as far as finance for businesses. And if you don't know what a PPA is or power purchase agreement, it's basically a 15 to 20 year contract where a third party owner basically builds the project on your rooftop or on your property. And it could be in a house as well. And they basically provide discounted electricity. And we found that a lot of businesses, especially during COVID, were trying to find ways to cut their costs. And this was a way of cutting costs and also being green. And that's a key point. You know, I've met with a lot of CFOs and building owners and no one 
one's willing to go green unless they're getting some sort of economic benefit or savings related to it. And actually, Tom Willard from Sage Energy Consulting talks about this in more detail. In episode 90 of the Solar Maverick podcast, he has a consulting company that helps schools and businesses go solar and help them make that decision. So it's kind of interesting to see how the PPA got very popular during this time. I mean, it was always popular financing method, but I think, you know, COVID made it more popular as companies were trying to save money. I think the huge thing that happened as well, at least in the U.S. solar industry, was the extension of the ITC, the investment tax credit. It was in the COVID relief bill at the end of December that President Trump or former President Trump signed. And what it did was it extended the ITC for another two years at 26%. So a 26% investment tax credit off the cost of the solar system for years 2021, 2022, and then it's 22% in 2023, and then 10% in 2024. And initially, basically going to be 22% this year in 2021, and then 10% in 2022. And I had some real concerns that there wouldn't be a lot of projects developed in the U.S. if it was 10% at 2022. And I'm obviously hoping, and I'm sure a lot of people in the industry are hoping, that there's a longer time with ITC at 26% or 30%. This episode of the Solar Maverick Podcast is brought to you by Podcast Laundry, the podcast concierge service that I use to make sure that my listeners hear the best quality show. They do the dirty work of podcasting for me. Yes, graphics, quotes, show notes, master editing, and much more. All I have to do is record. So if you're a busy podcaster like me with an engaged audience and want to free up time to do more of what you love to do, like going to the gym or spending time with loved ones, go to podcastlaundry.com to schedule your consultation or call 347-8 Seven one eight two seven three. That's podcastlaundry.com dot com or three four seven eight seven one eight two seven three. Thank you. The other thing that is really like driving the growth of renewables, specifically solar, is that more states and companies are having ambitious clean energy goals to be 100% renewable. President Biden as well has goals for 100% renewables in the U.S. by 2035. That's what he was saying during the campaign trail. And, you know, that's pretty aggressive if you think about that's only 14 years away. I think the Biden administration will create more benefits to renewable energy in the solar industry as we go forward. Also, the federal and local governments are going to use renewable energy to stimulate the economy through infrastructure and other things. So it'll be interesting to see what happens the next four years with this administration. The other thing, the Holy Grail is energy storage and why it's the Holy Grail or the game changer is that right now, you know, solar and specific and wind are intermittent power sources. Solar, you know, obviously it's only you could use when the sun's out, but storage actually gives the opportunity to use it at night and that changes everything. And we're seeing a lot more states pass legislation to incentivize solar and storage. We see that in New York with the value distributed energy resources incentive. We're seeing that in Massachusetts with the SMART program. And then we know that there's some legislation in New Jersey. Right now, I think like a lot of commercial industrial building owners are asking about standalone storage for backup power. You know, right now we think storage is too expensive, but we think we're going to see dramatic price decreases in the next two to three years that will make it economical. And specifically, we're talking about lithium ion technology because that's the most popular technology in storage. Also, the other thing, too, that I wanted to mention is that the publicly traded markets are now really an alternative for solar companies and solar stocks. It's pretty amazing that Tesla and Enphase are in the S&P 500. There's basically the solar sector in the publicly traded markets did extremely well in 2020. And then when President Biden won the election, that as well helped. And it seems like this year is also like started on a great start for clean energy. I know in general, the market's obviously been going up and hitting record highs. But it'll be interesting to see. I think you're going to see a lot more uh, solar companies going public and it'll be definitely interesting to watch. The other thing too that I've talked about before is community solar. If you're not familiar with community solar, I personally think community solar is going to be a lot bigger going forward. More states are going to pass legislation. Basically how community solar works is you have a solar project and you could sell the solar energy at residential rates instead of wholesale rates to the grid to residential customers and businesses in the utility service territory. So potentially the project could be at a higher margin than like say a utility scale 
capital project. But the great thing, it gives access to solar to people who don't normally have access to solar. There is a perception that solar is only for the wealthy. To own a solar project on your roof or to do a PPA, you have to have a credit score of 600 or above. So what you know, states have been doing, they've been actually incentivizing the development of solar for low moderate income communities. They've done that in New Jersey, New York, Maryland. We're actually working on a project in New York where the building owner is requiring a certain percentage of the customers to be LMI, low moderate income. The other thing too, it provides access to a lot more people. So there are people who are renters or live in an apartment building who don't have an opportunity to buy solar as well as maybe it could be a home where there's shading issues or other roof issues where they couldn't get solar. So really community solar creates more access to solar and a lot of developers are getting into it because usually like the projects have a higher return or potentially they could receive a higher development fee from it. The other thing as well that's really important too is I mentioned clean energy goals of companies getting to 100% renewables. So they're doing that through like corporate PPAs, which first they'll focus on putting solar on site, but then they'll do these offsite power purchase agreements that are structured for a contract for differences. And they basically buy power directly from a project that's in a different location. And that basically allows more solar to be developed or owned or, and financed because you're having this long-term contractual commitment to buy power from them. So corporations purchased a record 23.7 gigawatts of clean energy in 2020. That's up from 20.1 gigawatts in 2019 and 13.6 gigawatts in 2018. That's globally, according to research published by Bloomberg New Energy Finance, BNEF. The increase came despite a year devastated by COVID-19, a global recession, and uncertainty about U.S. energy policy ahead of the presidential administration, but it was due to surging stakeholder interest in corporate sustainability and expanding access to clean energy globally. The U.S. was once again the largest market, but it was less dominant than in previous years. Companies announced 11.9 gigawatts of corporate PPAs in the U.S. in 2020, down from 14.1 gigawatts in 2019, the first year-over-year drop since 2016. The first half coincided with the start of the pandemic, particularly subdued with companies announcing just 4.3 gigawatts of corporate PPAs in that period. I think you'll see corporate PPAs increase in the U.S. this year compared to last year. It's very complicated contracts to structure and it takes a lot of time. And it's hard for smaller companies that don't have like a dedicated energy department. So that's why you're seeing a lot of these big companies that are doing these corporate PPAs. But there are a lot of companies that want green energy and it's part of their sustainability goals. I think now, if we assume the pandemic started in March, now that we're kind of March of last year, almost like a year into it, companies are focused on their core business, but now they're focusing on other things that potentially could, you know, save money or be beneficial for the company long term. And the other thing that I was going to say about this is if you're interested in learning more about corporate PPAs, I wrote two articles on corporate PPAs and PV magazine and renewable energy world, which really goes into a lot more detail about how these companies contracts are structured and what's important to know. I'll add the links to this in the notes of the podcast. And the other thing too that I would like to talk about, I expect that there's going to be more like cost reduction driven by growth and development in certain technologies. The technologies that I know are the three that I'm going to talk about. But I think the key thing too as well is to talk about like there's so much innovation happening in the industry in all aspects and costs are continuing to go down. Obviously technology, we talked about financing, even how how we build these systems, you know, permitting costs in the future should go down, soft costs, things like that. But the real sort of three things that we're seeing, and, and most of the projects that I see today are incorporating this. The first is bifacial panels. That's new solar technology, allows both sides of the panel to generate power as much as 15%. Larger solar modules, this allows more of each panel surface area to generate power, leading to big gains in output. And then trackers, more installations, including motorized systems that track the sun's movement and change the alignment of the panels to increase energy capture. And now, you know, before I used to always see trackers in warm climates, but I'm also now seeing trackers in climates where they have snow. And the other big thing about this is like economically, it makes sense, like the additional cost that you would pay to have these things, it's offset by the increase in production. So this is the podcast on solar trends and year 2020 in review. 
if there are things that I didn't mention, you know, definitely reach out to us and let me know. What I thought is interesting is usually at the end of the podcast, I was surprised how much feedback that I received, like about a book suggestion, like Atomic Habits by James Clear or Lee Wang, who's the director of marketing at Renew Energy. We were talking about meditation at one episode and how like I was using the Headspace app, he was using Calm. And I'm surprised how much feedback we've gotten about that. And I wanted to suggest a book that I just recently finished, which is Think Like a Monk by Jay Shetty. I really enjoyed the book. It was written to help empower readers to find peace, calm, and purpose. The author, Jay, does this by drawing on his three-year experience as a monk to give readers actionable steps that they could take to think and act as a monk would. The goal of a monk's thinking is a life free of ego, envy, lust, anxiety, anger, bitterness, and baggage. The more we can elevate, understand, train, and strengthen our relationship with the mind, the more successfully we can navigate our lives and overcome challenges. I mean, that was pretty deep in itself, but there are so many interesting things that he talked about in the book. I'm just going to talk about two of them and we'll end the podcast. Our identity is wrapped up in what others think of us or more accurately, what we think others think of us. When we tune out the opinions, expectations, and obligations of the world around us, we begin to hear ourselves. The less time you fixate on everyone else, the more time you have to focus on yourself. The more we define ourselves in relation to the people around us, the more lost we are. And you definitely should check out the book. It's called Think Like a Monk by Jay Shetty. We'll definitely have it in the notes of the podcast. I want to, again, thank you to our listeners to listening to the podcast. Thank you for making time out of your busy schedule. I really appreciate it and have a great rest of your day. Thanks for listening to the Solar Maverick Podcast. The Solar Maverick Podcast is brought to you by Renew Energy. We're a solar development and consulting firm. If you believe that this podcast is adding value to you, please give us a five-star review and share with those that you think could benefit from this information. Please email all questions, suggestions, and feedback to info at renewenergy.com. That's I-N-F-O at R-E-N-E-U energy.com. The Solar Maverick Podcast is produced by Podcast Laundry and executive produced by Benoit Thangin and Kevin Y. Brown. 